All right, you can turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter four. We'll talk about the changed life of a truly saved Christian. Not a big detailed study, just a, two passages to go to. But uh, if you've seen my testimony video by now, um, one of the scriptures, part of the scriptures that I read there at the beginning, when you know talk about after I died as a lost man, then you know, as the Lord saved me, and I'm born again now. And uh, I went over First Peter chapter four, verses one through five, um, because it really embodies a lot of uh, what I was trying to say there. How the Lord changed my life. Um, I've made different decisions on my own, and it failed or just didn't work or whatever else. Um, me getting saved was not my decision as far as I just did some kind of thing and now I'm saying that I'm such and such. I came to the Lord at the end of myself, broken, and simply saying, God, I'm yours. If you save me, my life is yours. You tell me what to do. And I mean, I was down on my face on the floor saying, God, please save me. Please. And I was crying out to Him. And it wasn't just like I prayed some prayer, got up and said, oh, praise the Lord, I'm saved now. Or some people, you don't even have to pray the prayer. You just kind of go... Okay, I'm saved. You know, it's absurd. God saved me supernaturally. And He changed my life. Majorly changed my life. But I want to show you some interesting things here. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Okay? Um, you say, well, that's talking about imputed righteousness and things like No, it's not. It's just talking about Jesus Christ and things. Uh, did Jesus Christ ever have, have a need to cease from sin? No. We can look at what Jesus Christ went through and we can say, okay, He was out there. He suffered. He went through, you know, the Bible talks about in all points He was tempted, you know, like we are, yet without sin. He went through the different temptations. You know, He was raised in Egypt, for crying out loud. I mean, that... Talk about a terrible place to be raised. He was raised there. He saw bad things and whatever else. And yet, all that temptation, and yet he never sinned. See? Arm yourselves, likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. You know what's so interesting to me? About the easy believism heretics out there? They'll tell you there's no need to turn from sin. There's no changed life that happens that's necessary. It can or it doesn't have to. And I'm going, do you suffer with sin? See, that's the real issue here. They don't suffer in the world out there and in sin. They don't mind sin. It doesn't bother them. But those of us that came to the end of ourselves, we came there because we were living in sin and we were having a horrible time in the world. And about ready to blow our brains out and just like, God, if you don't save me soon, I'm just going to kill myself. And if I go to hell, fine, whatever. I don't care. I want out of this life that I have. It's miserable. It's terrible. Please help me. He that suffered in the flesh, you see. He that suffers in the flesh. I want help. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick... I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 2, 17. You're sick. You're tired of the life that you used to have. You want a change. Do you understand? And so, when the Lord saves you, it's not that you cease from sin in the sense of you don't lie, you don't ever, you're not ever jealous, or you're, you're not prideful. Or, no, 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 no. That's not it. It's talking about sins that you used to struggle with. You know? Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary, the old hymn says. You go through years and years and years of messing around in the world, you get saved and you say, oh, thank you, finally somebody can help me get out of this life that I've had. You cease from the sins of your past, you see. Your life changes. And what a glorious change. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Another old hymn. Verse 2. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. All of a sudden, your interests change. All of a sudden, your life changes. And the things that you used to do in your past, now you don't want anything to do with them anymore. Why? Because of a supernatural rebirth. Not because of the mind saying, I have now prayed the prayer, I have now believed by faith or some other kind of a thing, so now I'm going to live according to the Baptist faith or the confessions of Calvin or the Roman Catholic Catechism or the uh, Book of Discipline, you know, Methodist Book of Discipline or something like this. Mm -mm, no. God's Holy Spirit moves in and starts to say, change that, stop doing that, I'm going to help you with this. Yeah. You want to live according to the will of God. Verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, giving yourself over to animal desires, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. You say, wait a second, yo, huh? Hold on there, you're supposed to be a dispensational preacher, Brian. But look at that, it says, oh, uh, suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. See, Peter is writing to the Jews. So this has to be for the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, well, the problem with that is, if you go over to 1 Timothy, chapter, get it here, excuse me, 2 Timothy. I always get 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy mixed up on 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16 is about you know, the mystery of godliness. 2 Timothy 3.16 is about the purpose of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. That the man of God may try to not sin, but he'll still be sinning his whole... No, it doesn't say that either. It says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And don't give me this thing of, well, it's just about imputed righteousness, brother, because, you know, none of us can really be perfect. And so, technically, in Christ, the, the sins are paid for. The, we're supposed to strive against sin. We're supposed to fight against sin. We're supposed to purify our lives. Again, all these different systems out there, all this different stuff, it's all about, let's bring the standards down on sin. Let's take an easier, lighter attitude towards sin. That's what it's about. But let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. So we see all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So I can use this even if it's for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. And I don't believe it is. Uh, first and second Peter, I believe, are, you know, Peter is the apostle of the circumcision, the Jews. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, I believe that they're writing to the same group. Saved Jews, saved Gentiles. I believe that that's what's going on there. Now, of course, God has given the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, there's a, you know, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming in, come in. So there's a sense there spiritually where there aren't going to be as many getting saved as there will be in the Gentile world. So some of it in First and Second Peter will kind of overlap and like, if you don't get it now, you're going to get it in the time of Jacob's trouble kind of a deal. But there's still a lot of things that could be called, rightly called church age doctrine in First and Second Peter. And this is one of them. And I'm going to show you it lines up with what Paul said, okay, to the uh, Ephesians. But let's continue here. <clears throat> And we saw, saw all the things there, walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Yeah. Uh, what is one of the big idolatries that Americans and people, well, anybody today, what's one of the big idolatries? Take heed, beware of covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness. You make an idol of the new truck that you want, or the new snowmobile, or the new ATV, or the new dress if you're a woman, or the new purse, or the new shoes, or the new, you see what I'm saying? Covetousness. And in the past, what was the point of fighting against it, you see, when you're lost? You walked in the thing of abominable idolatries. Yeah. But look at what people think. The relatives that you have that were in the past that knew you back then, look what they think. Verse 4, 1 
Peter chapter 4, verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Hey, we're having a big Christmas party. Oh, man, everybody's going to be there and, and things. And oh, we're you know, going to have a little bit of, you know, alcohol and stuff like that. It's, oh, it's going to be it's going to be a blast. It's going to be a wild party. You coming? Are you kidding me? I'm not coming to that thing. Oh, you got plans? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay home and read the Bible. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, okay, man, seriously, seriously. Are you coming to the party or not? Or aren't you? Um, actually, I was being serious. I'm going to stay home and read the Bible. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, whatever. All right, uh, well, it was nice talking to you. Did you hear what this, did you hear what he's doing? He's staying home reading the Bible. I think it's weird. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you right now, it'll get to the point as a Christian where you get invited to things and stuff like that from family or friends or whatever else, and you just say, nope, sorry, not coming. Well, so-and-so's going to be there. You're going to offend them. I can care less. I don't care. I haven't been invited to a birthday party or whatever. I had a niece get married. Oldest brother's, uh, not oldest brother, uh, older brother, uh, my brother Dean, his daughter Anna got married. I didn't. Even, we didn't even get a, a wedding invitation. I didn't even know she got married. Why? Because they don't want uh, old Uncle Brian there with his King James Bible. He's uh, militant. He's going into a cult mentality. He's this, he's that. <laughs> Whatever. I could care less. Got to get to that point. Verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Okay. We're going to give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Oh, well, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should go to that family event or maybe I should go to the wedding there at the Catholic Church because I was invited. And Maybe I should go. I don't want to offend anybody. Are you going to offend God by going? Well, well, what? If you're going to offend the Lord, then don't go. Well, they, they, they might write me out of the will. Good. Uh, they might never speak to me again. Also good. Yeah. Um, you see, when you have a changed life as a Christian, now you have a responsibility to live for the Lord. You're His property. So you have to go through that process of sanctification. And anything that gets in the way of that sanctification, you say, get that out of here. I'm walking with the Lord. I don't want this stuff from the world anymore. You see? It's the way it's supposed to be. But if you still want to say, well, you know, 1 Peter is, you know, for the Jews. It's only for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, let me ask you a question. Are they going to have a closer connection to the Lord to cease from sin than a Bible-believing Christian does today? Some Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble that can take the mark of the beast and lose their salvation. They're going to have a closer connection to the Lord and a more of an ability to cease from sin than you do right now as a Christian, connected to Jesus Christ, one flesh with Jesus Christ? You say, well, okay, maybe it is partly for a Jewish Christian. Okay, um, God's, there's no respect of persons with God. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. You see? I'm a dispensationalist. I am a dispensationalist. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. That's where, you know, some of the stuff starts to come in there. They say, well, Peter, you know, that's, that's he's a different church. Um, <clears throat> and Paul, he's the church of the one body or something like this. He's foolish nonsense. Um, no, actually, they're going to different groups. So if you find a Jewish person and they're saying, oh, I don't know, I you know this Pauline epistle stuff, it, some of the things he's writing there, you know, one man esteems one day above another and another every, you know, day alike and, and let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Well, I don't know what to do. You say, okay, turn him to First Peter, read that stuff. Different instructions for different Christians is what I see it as. All right. <clears throat> but let's see what Paul has to say about the thing of a changed life. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. 
through 32. This I say, therefore, and let's see if this lines up with what Peter was saying in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Huh. They both mention Gentiles. Both of them are Jewish. Peter and Paul are both Jewish. Let's continue. <laughs> Having the understanding darkened, being alienated, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Can you say that about your relatives? Mm -hmm. Understanding darkened. Having the understanding darkened. Yes. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Yes. Because of the blindness of their heart. Yes. Why is their heart blind? Let me demonstrate. That's why their eyes are blinded. Why, why their heart is blinded. You know why? They got their hand over their eyes. Hey, the Bible here condemns your sin. I don't see it in there. Hey, God created this earth. Isn't this amazing? I don't see it. I believe in the theory of evolution. <laughs> they don't want to see. That's the whole point. They have no desire to change. Verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. There's that word again. Animal desires. Living like an animal. You get these guys standing around stuff, truck stop, you know, whatever else, and the tough guys and stuff. Yeah, man, let me tell you about this girl I was with last night. Yeah, the skunk over there in the weeds did the same thing, stupid. Boy, you sure are good at breeding. So are the animals. You know, well, I, I, can, t I can eat a, a dozen of donuts in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, so can a dog. Congratulations, you're a real stud. You know, <laughs> But you get pressured by that as a Christian. You want to kind of give in and you kind of get, want to do the talking as well, right? <clears throat> Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Covetousness, in other words. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth is only in Jesus. Always remember that. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, and compromising in certain sins that you want to because you've got to get along with your family members and co-workers. No. Righteousness, true holiness, put off the former conversation, put off the old man. He's dead. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a temptation, you know. I'm a, you know, I was like heavily into motorsports. Still got to do that part of the testimony thing coming up here sometime. Very heavily into motorsports. I still, you know, if I go to some motorcycle dealership or something like that, I start coveting. <laughs> you know, just going to confess that as a fault. All right. And, you know, money, uh, not having much money keeps me from, you know, coveting to the point of sinning as far as buying things and stuff. But the whole the whole point is, I can get rather carnal. And I can start to forget the fact I'm a preacher. I'm a Christian and I'm a preacher. Full-time ministry. And I can start talking just like I'm a lost man. You know, you know, I used to have this one thing here and I used to do this and that. Did you, does this thing have a... Is this carbureted or fuel injected? or Oh, really? Okay. Is shaft drive and things like that? Oh, that's pretty neat. Put off the old man. You're a new man. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You should remind people of Jesus Christ. There's supposed to be righteousness and true holiness in your life. Verse 25, Wherefore, put away, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. How about that one? Putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Another tough thing to do. Again, you know, I'm kicking myself here. The scriptures have a good way of doing that. <laughs> Verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, 
Never, neither give place to the devil. How do you give place to the devil? If uh, you're interested in righteousness and true holiness, you know how you do it? By taking a light attitude towards sin. Sin is the devil's calling card. If he can get you to sin, if he can get you to mess up, he's got an inroad. He's got a place. You know? I'll tell you a little story. Um, down in West Virginia, my sister, older sister, lives down there with her husband. They have live on a farm down there. And uh, they know a woman. She's a Native American woman, and she used to be married to a white guy that was a you know, Freemason. And the one night, her husband, scumbucket that he was, was out playing cards, uh, you know, poker or whatever else kind of a thing. And uh, he was losing pretty bad. And so he said to one of the guys at the table, he said, I'll tell you what I'll put up for the next, you know, raise your bet or whatever else they do. I never got into playing cards. Praise the Lord for that. But he said, I'll put my wife up. If I lose, you get to go fornicate with her. He lost. And this Native American woman, she's there, and this, she gets this knock at the door, and there's this guy there, this Freemason, and he tells her what happened, and he's, you know, and he's drunk, and she she grabbed something and chased him. She's gonna kill the guy, you know. Get that Native American, you know, wild spirit, you know, just came out, and she's I'm gonna kill you, you know. And he took off running. But when he was running, his one shoe fell off. That's how frantically running trying to get away from this crazy woman that he, you know, his one shoe fell off. She grabbed the shoe. Next time she's in town and there's this mason over there that was at her house that night and his, his wife standing there with him. And she walks up in front of everybody and she goes, does this look familiar? And the guy's face turned red and the wife went, huh? And she said, and she told the whole story. There's the shoe back. Hmm. Um, did you leave something behind with sin? Did you leave your uh, internet activity behind online? What you were looking at that you shouldn't have been looking at? Did you uh, darken the doors of some store where you shouldn't have been? Did you go hang out with people that you shouldn't have been hanging out with? What are you doing? Oh, you're giving place to the devil. You're giving the devil some uh, ammunition, so to speak, that he can use as he's accusing you day and night up there. What are we supposed to do, brethren? We're supposed to have holiness and righteousness. True holiness and righteousness. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have a changed life. And the devil's ministers are down here right now saying to you, there's no changed life. There's no repentance. There's no turning from sin. There's none of that stuff. Oh, that stuff. That's lordship salvation and things like this. And you look in your Bible and you say, what, what is lordship salvation? I don't see the term in here. It's a man-made term that a bunch of sick devils have created to get people to get all philosophical about sin and things like this. Because they're trying to justify themselves. They can't stand the Bible is the reality of it. Let's continue. Verse 28. Changed life. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Total changed life. Here's a guy who's a thief, probably been to jail a few times and whatever else, gets saved, and he's out there working, and he comes up to somebody he's stole from, and he says, here, this is for you. Is this some kind of trick or something? I don't have any. Do you want my money or something? No, 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 no. I don't want your money. I got saved. The old timers, they'd call it so-and-so got religion. It meant a changed life, you see. There's a famous story of Alvin York. They even made a Hollywood movie about it. I don't recommend that. But, you know, I have the book here someplace. Um, see if I can just see it quick. I have it here somewhere. And... Uh, Alvin York was a, was a real uh, rotten young man. He was a World War I war hero here in America. And a uh, real, real bad guy. And uh, he got saved. And his whole life just went whoop. Bar hopping, womanizing, fighting, shooting 
just violent guy and everything else, just a wild man, and he got saved and just whoop, teaching Sunday school, reading the Bible. His life changed. And I remember the one time, I've, the uh, biography that I have of him, and um, his biographer was sitting there talking to him, and he said, uh, tell me about your life before you got saved, before you became a Christian, born-again Christian. And he, and he said, Alvin York just looked at him, and he just went, nope. He wouldn't talk. Just shook his head. Didn't even want to talk about it. Changed life. Verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day, unto the day of redemption. Excuse me. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, if you look up there, uh, verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God by resurrecting the old man. Hmm. It's kind of like uh, a child and they have a, a favorite toy or something like that. And um, that toy falls in the toilet or something and gets extremely defiled. And the parent says, there's no way I can fix this. I'm sorry, son. And they take it and they throw it in the trash. And a little while later, a couple days later, they smell this horrible smell in the one room in the child's bedroom. And they go, what in the world is going on here? And they look over underneath the bed and there's that toy laying there. All over the sheets, all over the carpet and everything else. And they go, what are you doing? That's disgusting. Well, that's the way it is with a Christian that resurrects parts of their old life. That wants to hang on to those certain things. They don't want that new life, that changed life. The filthy rags of your own self-righteousness, you know? And you resurrect that. You forget that you're born again. That you're supposed to be different. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Uh, I try to be real nice to the brethren. I really do. I mean, I've had people come to me and they say, Brother Brian, I really have messed up. And they tell me what they've done. I say, oh, brother, what are you, you, know, what are you doing about that or whatever else? And I will be the most gentle, loving guy that you've ever seen. Um, my anger is reserved for those people like the Pharisees in Jesus' time that were trying to continually turn people away from the truth. Um, my anger and my harsh speech is for those people that are trying to destroy and pervert the Word of God and pervert the Gospel. I'll be harsh on them. But if I see somebody and I see, yet they genuinely, they, they told me their testimony and things like that, I think that they are genuinely saved. They're being honest with me. They're saying, Brother, I just did this thing or I'm really struggling with this. You know, can you help me? Can you offer some support here? What should I do? And, and things like that. I'm going to be gentle. Okay? But if I see sin, if I see somebody involved in open sin and they're unrepentant, um, I'm going to be a lot harsher in the future. Uh, I need to be. So, And I'm going to be a lot harsher on myself. Uh, I want to be used mightily of the Lord. Uh, I want to, you know, I want to be able to stand before the Lord someday and have Him say, well done, our good and faithful servant. Uh, that's what I want. And the only way I can have that is to have a changed life and to cease from sin. So oh, sinless perfection. He's teaching sinless perfectionism. Shut your mouth. I'm not teaching sinless perfection. That is nonsense. I have a whole study against the thing of sinless perfection. What I am teaching is the things that I know are wrong in my life and the Lord's convicting me, I need to stop those. That's what it means to cease from sin. Are you going to do it? 
Right now, I can tell you right now as a Christian, there is a connection here that's the Holy Spirit of God. And you can't, you know, I might not be able to talk to you and whatever else and see you face to face and whatever. And maybe it's a sin that you are very ashamed of and you don't want to tell any about it, anybody about it, much less put it in the comments for everybody to see. You know, you're just like, I really have this thing, whatever. But here's the whole point. If you have something like that in your life, the Holy Spirit is telling you about it right now. He's there. I don't have to control you and you become a Denlingerite officially and I send you the t-shirt and the little badge or whatever. I don't need to do that. The Holy Spirit is going to get in touch with you and is going to tell you what you need to clean up. And you say, well, uh, I don't agree with this change life thing. I don't. I, this is Lordship salvation and works salvation and whatever else. Uh, let me tell you right now, your self-righteousness and whatever sins you're holding on to that you don't want to give up is going to land you in hell. You are trying to gain the whole world. You're going to end up losing your soul. I will tell you that right now. So I pray that you repent. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're messing around with, I pray that you repent of it. I pray that you get sick of it. Give it up. Come to the Lord as a sinner understanding that you've sinned against a holy, righteous God and that you need His help to get you out of that life of sin that you have. You better do it.